Howard, I'm honored to be here honoring Howard, which I, who I admire uh, very much, uh, especially uh, through the work he has done as director of, of 3IE, uh, which, which has really has uh, been spectacular over the few years uh, that he has been there as director. He really changed this and positioned this into a very, very uh, relevant an important organization in the in the discussion of policy and, and evaluation and um, one of the things that I uh, that I have seen through these years uh, since Howard was actually appointed as director uh, in 3IE is that at, at the moment this was these were the years 2007 8 you be started in 2008 yeah. Uh, in those years, which is not very long ago, uh, the, uh, there was a lot of discussion in the, uh, in the world of the uh, uh, non-profit organizations that uh, give uh, grants for development, governments, academia, that there was not enough evidence about what worked in, for promoting development or for uh, solving specific problems that were important for countries. Even now in the two previous presentations, you could see several times this expression that not enough uh, evidence is available. But precisely one of the missions of 3IE was to promote the generation of more evidence in a systematic way. Now, and I think this was very clear in the first presentation of China with a map of all the randomized trials, now, of course, there will, there will always be more need for, for evidence. But there are many, many more evaluations going on, many more results, published work. China is only one of the examples, and you can see there how many things are going on. So of course, the question is still uh, that we need evidence to take better decisions uh, in the policy world. But now, perhaps a more critical question is that even with a lot of evidence out there, even if it's insufficient, it's a lot more than some years ago, the question is, if the evidence is being used actually for uh, improving policy. And uh, what I want to talk about uh, today in these few minutes is precisely about uh, where, where we are there, but more importantly perhaps uh, where we should go. And there, uh, I, think I chose this, this topic precisely because I think this is one of Howard's and Howard's team, uh, team uh, very important contributions in these years in 3IE. I, I will talk about some of the examples of what they have done. But then uh, what I, I want to discuss also why this happens, why there is more evidence, but why it is not uh, used as we would expect. And again, I think the previous two presentations were already very eloquent about this. Uh, I want to give you a particular example of how, uh, where, where we are in Latin America in terms of the design of the government for being able to uh, to uh, uh, use evaluation information or evidence for, uh, for policy making. And, and finally, some cases of uh, how you evaluate the evaluation function when you go from producing evaluation, where perhaps it is easier to evaluate uh, whoever is doing the evaluation. You can evaluate in terms of the number of evaluations, the technical quality. But that's a totally different question than when you want to measure evaluation, uh, the outcome of evaluation in terms of the use for improving policy. Evaluating the evaluation function when that is the objective is, is much more complex, but there are already some interesting examples uh, that, that I think are relevant. And actually one of the examples is from Ian's work in South Africa. I didn't know you were going to chair the session. Uh, but uh, fortunately you are, uh, and you will see the examples and you will be able to correct me also. So uh, in when, again, when 3IE started, the main question was how do we promote the generation of more evidence? That was the basic question. And uh, 3IE took this very seriously, and along the way, several people in 3IE, uh, in the board and in the organization, and Howard himself, uh, were, were uh, started to become much more aware that having all these new evaluations was of course very important, but that was not enough. Uh, it was important to make sure that, that, uh, that, that, uh, that all this new evidence was used. And one, uh, there is one uh, particular uh, reason why this is a very relevant qu question 
uh, more broadly, not only for 3A, which is that, for example, in the evaluations we heard about today in the first two presentations, most of the resources for funding those evaluations come from taxes paid by citizens in the country. So uh, having evaluation only as an academic uh, motivation or as an academic venture is, of course, justifiable in some grounds. But generally speaking, if you ask, ask the uh, average taxpayer if they agree in that their taxes go for paying somebody to do research, you might find different opinions, but I could almost assure you that many will not find that connection very attractive. They would prefer, perhaps, to have other kinds of benefits. So when you talk about public resources, this is a very relevant question. What, in the end, what is the outcome? And uh, one thing that uh, the team in 3AE and how I realized is that, of course, uh, evaluation and evidence is very important, is critical for transparency, for accountability of government actions, uh, mostly, but also uh, for private donors. But uh, evaluate the third element, it's not only transparency and accountability, but making sure that the evaluation is relevant for improvement. And that is where I think there is still uh, a long way to go. 3IE has made uh, important progress in this, and I would encourage those that are not uh, very familiar with 3IE to go into the website and to look at some of these uh, elements. For example, uh, one thing that they realized very early on was that the existence of evidence doesn't mean that it will go into policy. You can have the best uh, evaluations or evidence in the world produced by Nobel Prizes, the best ever technically, even if that's in the desk of a policymaker, a report like that, that doesn't guarantee at all that that evidence will translate into better or improved policy. Uh, there has to be a communication effort among, among other things. And, but this is where 3IE has worked a lot and I think is an interesting case of moving from evaluating from the use of evaluation. And there are several examples. For example, uh, one of them is that in 3IE when you get a grant, uh, and I, you mentioned this in the first presentation, uh, sometimes it's, it, it's difficult at the early stages uh, to get this going and to really make it uh, uh, influence the way evaluation is made. But for grants at 3IE, you're asked to submit a policy influence plan. And the following, uh, the policy influence plan is a plan not only of what I intend to affect or to uh, change in the world, with the evaluation in terms of, of a policy, a specific policy, but how will you, will you engage will, with policy makers or with stakeholders in the particular program or action you're evaluating to make sure that the information is more accessible to them? That is an, an important effort. Another one is that there's something called the policy window where you can uh, uh, submit an, uh, even an evaluation or a, a, a research agenda to be developed around certain very clearly specified policy questions. Another very attractive one that I would encourage uh, some of you that are thinking of about a PhD uh, research topics uh, to look at is the gap maps, which is an analysis of what we do know based on evidence and what we don't know about uh, different uh, topics. And of course, there's uh, there are huge opportunities in, in looking at what we don't know. And then there's another very interesting product called Systematic Review, which is an analysis of all the information that is available from different uh, evaluations that, that do fulfill several uh, different technical standards. What does that information tell us? Uh, how can we interpret that evidence? And these are all uh, efforts for trying to link more closely the production of evaluation from the use of evaluation, which are two different actors uh, most of the times, with very few exceptions. So why, why is this effort necessary? And again, I think the, the two previous uh, presentations were very, very clear about this. But uh, when you look at how uh, a government operates, again, we're talking about public programs uh, mainly, uh, the, the issue is that many times there are no incentives to use evaluation even though even if it's very rigorous very high quality and there are many reasons why this happens one again uh, mentioned already before is timing and then the issue with timing is that uh, when when you go when when we talk about governments it's not a just an entity there uh, floating around it's actually people 
that have positions of uh, decision-making positions at certain time and certain place. And for them, for, for people that are taking decisions based of, on evidence, if you go and offer uh, and uh, to undertake an evaluation that will re be ready in four years when this person might actually not even be there anymore, could be totally relevant, even if the issue is relevant, ev even if it's technically solid, if it will generate knowledge in general. That is simply not attractive if, if it's not useful for taking decisions at the time you need to take a decision. And uh, evaluations, rigorous evaluations, usually take time from constructing a baseline, implementing the the whatever action or, and, uh, that is specified in the design, measuring the effect of the of the action, and then if, if you want to use it for improvement, then using that results to go back and improve the design again. That simply takes a lot of time, and most of the times people don't even know how long they will be in those positions. So there is a lot of uncertainty of engaging in a venture that you don't even know if you will capitalize or, or see the results in the future. And that's simply the way it is. It's not that it's good or bad, it's the way it is. And this la uh, difficulty in synchronization can be a deterrent for, for uh, generating evaluation or for being interested in looking for, for uh, evidence, for the generation of evidence. Another important um, issue is that, is that there are, of course, uh, interest groups, and this happens a lot in, uh, in randomized uh, experiments, in experimental designs, where you have to define a control group. So, for example, in China, in the example we were uh, being shown of the, the glasses, I'm sure that at some point you were faced with the questions of why did you choose these kids and not the other? And that can be, it can be uh, go both ways in the case of China. One, if the glasses were perceived as good, some will be very happy and some not because they do have the glasses. But because of what you're saying, it could be even the other way around. We don't want the glasses, give them to the other kids. No? Why, why us? But that's an issue. And, and when, uh, operationally, when you actually are performing an evaluation, that's an issue. And it becomes even worse because, paradoxically, if you start generating evidence that something works, it is more costly to leave people out. And again, in China, when you show these figures, perhaps now the demand is to, to do more, but then that means that you won't have your control group and you won't be able to explore things further. So sometimes managing an evaluation uh, not operationally, not in terms of only ha assuring that the benefit uh, gets where it should be, but sustaining an evaluation effort can be very complicated. Uh, this has happened, for example, with many conditional cash transfer programs where it's very difficult to explain to people why it would be bad that they receive a cash benefit. If you explain, well, this is to, to see whether the effect is really important, this, uh, uh, how can it be bad that you give me cash? I want to be in that <laughs> group also. Then uh, you can do your whatever experiments you want. But, and, and the more uh, evidence there is that this works, more pressure to get into, into the, uh, to uh, access the benefits. And of course, there's also politics, again, uh, discussed uh, earlier. And one of the, uh, the elements in politics that sometimes is, is perhaps the most important is that when you evaluate a program, in the end you will, uh, you will uh, lead to a value judgment of whether the action is good or not. From the point of view of the researcher, perhaps it's not uh, an ideologically led uh, 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 issue. I mean, it, saying it's good or bad is just very simple, this intervention works or not, it doesn't have many other implications. But for a policymaker, a president, a minister, a secretary that goes out, launches this huge program, then you don't want anybody coming and tell you that that doesn't really work. So evaluation sounds good in theory, but and, and when you know that uh, you will get a good result, but when there's a risk that the results might not show what you want, even they can explain, you, explain to you a thousand times that the evidence is very rigorous, pure, etc. Simply it's not attractive for a policymaker to be exposed uh, having this information. There's, then there's the role of the media, which in some countries is very relevant and that can also be a deterrent for evaluation. Many times I've seen this in many Latin American countries, there's a very high quality evaluation technically speaking, in terms of being able to measure very, with a, a high level of precision, the impact of an intervention. The results are generally good. And then in a footnote, it says, 
well, but uh, whatever other result was not as strong. And then in the, the next day, you see in the headlines what was in the footnote that some reporter uh, got out of the, the, of, of the text. And that is what everybody f focuses on. Nobody wants to listen to the good news. They only look at this very particular footnote. But then the, the role of the media in interpreting and communicating evaluation re and, or evidence results can be very damaging or very supportive, depending on the characteristics of, of, the, of the media. And then a third question, also very practical, is uh, sometimes you know you might even have some indication that a program is not working. And uh, some might, someone might come to you and say, you know, we, ha we can evaluate this and know if it's really not working so you can use those resources more effectively in another intervention, which, make, which makes uh, absolutely uh, a whole lot of sense. But sometimes that's not feasible. Even if you have evidence that, that, that something doesn't work, you simply cannot just tell people, you know, this program, there's this evidence, this program is shut down and see you later. And actually, there's, there are many examples of this. One uh, very uh, illustrative one is from Mexico, from the uh, Progresa and then Oportunidades Evaluation, an evaluation that has gone on for many years. And one of the results, uh, this was along the way, after several rounds of evaluation, a, a very high quality evaluation. They, the evaluation showed that in the first years of primary, uh, this intervention starts at third grade of primary that from third to, th to sixth year of primary, there was practically no impact. If you stop giving the cash transfer, children will still be going to school. So you could uh, eliminate or, or start uh, to give the transfers later, let's say when uh, children enter into uh, secondary education, and the same money, which is a lot, because there are many children in school at those ages, you could use for other things within the same program, perhaps expanding the scholarships, or the transfers where there is greater school out in, in high school, for example. And that, again, makes a lot of sense. But then how do you go uh, the next day and explain that 5 million families in Mexico and like 15 million children will stop getting a benefit next year because it was found that that, uh, that, that uh, didn't, was not working in the way it was supposed to work. If you have something else, to give in return, perhaps there's no problem. But, but just simply eliminating a benefit just like that can have huge political costs and it's not always feasible to do it. So that's again an example where even you can, when you have a great evaluation, great evaluation results, the use of that information is not direct and automatic. Then of course there's a, an issue of technical capacities in the people that, have, uh, that are in the decision-making positions in governments using the evidence. And here, again, I, I have seen many examples, but the, the one I like the most is when uh, in the Ministry of, uh, well, I, it's, it's not Mexico, it's another country, but in the Ministry of Social Development of another Latin American country, there was a presentation to the minister about a great uh, evaluation that was done on incentives uh, to teachers for improving their performance in the classroom. And it was really a beautiful evaluation technically. And this, uh, the, the person that presented it, a very reputed uh, uh, academic, uh, very, very well known and famous, came to the minister and started presenting. And then he was very excited because this was a very good evaluation. And in the end he said, and the great thing about it is that this improved uh, the uh, outcomes, uh, outcomes, learning outcomes from, from children in a half of a standard deviation. And the minister, stayed there and I mean they didn't want to uh, show that they had no that she had no clue of what they were talking about but this was talking a totally different language and it was a great evaluation but it it didn't have the capacity to communicate to the decision maker what uh, really the importance was and also what to do <clears throat> what to do with this information uh, then, uh, well, again, there are incentives. Uh, I think it was very eloquently presented in the first presentation. Sometimes for the researcher, the interest is a publication that has nothing to do with uh, having this information used for decision making, and that's very legitimate in some settings. The policymakers' incentives might be totally, totally different. 
Uh, and then also the practitioners or people operating programs also start getting involved with a program and become actors in this process. And sometimes they can be very, uh, they can be key for using or not uh, the information produced uh, by evidence. In, in uh, Latin America, uh, you can, when you look at how governments are organized, it is very clear that the, the institutional design is also an important element. For example, you would expect, this is theory only, of course, wishful thinking, that a policy would be implemented through a cycle where it starts with a very clear diagnostic of the problem, perhaps through an evaluation, planning targets and objectives based on the, on the diagnostics, then have a, a program design, a design policy, financing, implement, implementing the actions, monitoring, and then measuring the effect of that intervention, and then going back, what you would expect is that you would go back to the planning stage, fine tune a program given that you have better evidence, and then go, go on again. When, uh, by analyzing uh, 18 Latin American countries, which, which functions they have, it turns out that uh, many countries don't even have a function, even if, uh, uh, doing it or not correctly is another issue, but just having the function is simply not there. So there are some countries like Chile, Guatemala, Mexico, Nicaragua, Peru, Dominican Republic, Uruguay, where they have the function somewhere in the government. And the rest of the countries are lacking uh, one or two or even more like in the case of, of Bolivia or Honduras. So in these countries, even, though, even if evidence is there produced, there is something in the system that will most probably not allow you to use evaluation, to feed into policy, improve uh, the design and then go back again to execution and measuring and measuring again. And generally in the countries that do have this function, uh, there are three kinds of models, all with advantage, adv advantages and challenges. One is what could be called a centralized model where you have, this is the most common, where you have a central agency in the government which is typically the finance ministry or the planning ministry and they are in charge of evaluating government actions in general. In that case, uh, one advantage is that these agencies tend to have very detailed information of uh, how programs operate. And the most important thing is that since they have control of the budget, they can enforce uh, changes in, uh, or improvements in, in programs or, or actions, sometimes based on influence, sometimes based on, on many other things, but they do have that capacity. So if, if these kind of entities have better evidence at hand, you would expect that that would feed into uh, the, the design and execution process. The problem, uh, there are also several challenges. One problem is that these offices tend to uh, focus more on the positive, on accounting for government results and putting them in the annual report. They also have limited capacity to actually follow up in all government agencies and assure that whatever should be improved is improved in reality. And uh, the main limitation is that since they evaluate all government agencies from the military to social development, it is very difficult to have one instrument or one evaluation or monitoring strategy fit all. So sometimes you have uh, instruments that could be relevant in general, but not very relevant for particular uh, sectors. Uh, then there, there are some uh, countries that have uh, offices of evaluation, for example, in the, in the um, uh, de de social development ministry. These are Brazil, Chile, Guatemala, and Peru. And here there are also several advantages. One is that uh, the same sector is uh, d d that generates information and, and an office within that, s that same ministry can have access to information. It can cl uh, look closer at the execution agencies and communicate with them much more fluidly to uh, explain and make evidence more useful. Uh, but uh, it has to maintain independence from policy to be, to play its role. And that is also an advantage of some of the designs, particularly these four countries, and sorry, Brazil is uh, twice there. But then there are also several challenges. One is that uh, they, they, there's also, a, there's a, most of the times a tension between having an evaluator within the same ministry, which seems like the policeman looking or uh, looking at everybody, what everybody else does to, to say if, it's okay, if they're doing their job well or not. There are potential tensions between having very rigorous evaluations, but not 
perhaps not very useful in practice. And also, there is an issue of transparency and accountability. You might have a result, and this happens, I've seen this happen many times in ministries, that perform an evaluation or conduct an evaluation. The results are not particularly good for the program, so the evaluation is, is kept in a, in a drawer and nobody even knows that it uh, existed. And finally, there's a model followed by Mexico through the Coneval, which is an independent, uh, a case of uh, an independent office outside of the ministry that is in charge of evaluation. This has the advantages of higher credibility, academic rigor. It's much more difficult to ask Coneval not to make an evaluation public, as in the previous example. It also is uh, good for transparency, accountability, but it also has so some shortcomings. For example, uh, the potential, there's this potential tension again between academic rigor and relevance, the uh, transparency and uh, political costs of having a government agency, even if it's not in the ministry, releasing uh, what could be negative uh, results. But the main limitation is that since it's relatively far away from the executors of government programs, it is very hard for an institution like this to make sure that the information is actually used for, for improvement. So if, uh, if, if we think more as the evaluation of the evaluation function as an instrument to improve policy, of course also with accountability and uh, more transparency, how, an interesting question is how can you evaluate an institution or an evaluator? For example, how could 3IE be evaluated? Would we evaluate 3IE only on the basis of the number of evaluations that it's produced over the years? Or should we try to follow up and see what has it improved in, in terms of programs? Or as the name of the conference uh, today says, improving people's lives. That would be the ultimate uh, proof of what is the value added of, of, uh, of 3IE. And, this, uh, and actually that, that, that is not uh, very simple because when you look uh, at the evaluation function, in most cases, what you find is that there's, as, if you ask an evaluator to do their own uh, logical framework, evaluators usually go and ask uh, program operators to do something similar than this, and they spend a lot of time in that. And when you think of the evaluation function and the, the, um, yeah, this logical framework, of course, uh, at the bottom you would have the activities that the organization does, the results in this case, Th this I'm taking from uh, real uh, examples in, in evaluation offices in Latin America. May mostly the results are phrased as providing decision makers with evidence, analysis and recommendations for improvement of social programs. And then the, the purpose or the final goal is to contribute, and I would underline the, world, the word contribute, to improve the performance and accountability of social policies and programs. The problem with this or the limitation is that Contribute is a very broad, uh, a very uh, broad word. You can contribute and still have absolutely no impact. You can say, I contributed because I generated the evaluations. Perhaps then the evaluations were never used. So the question is, was the evaluation function successful or not? Uh, so th this is how the uh, most evaluation pr uh, offices in Latin America are operating under this scheme which does have, I think, that, that limitation. Uh, there are at least two very important questions of why this is such a big debate and why there's a logic to defining the logical framework of an evaluation function in that way. The first is the question of whether uh, evaluation results can be enforced even by law on uh, program operators. For example, can you go and say, since in China, the glasses work, now you as a responsible of the schools in China, you have to have all children have glasses. And if you don't, there's a penalty for that. That would be enforcing. And there's a debate because one part of the story, of course, is the evidence, but the other is what happens on the day to day. Uh, there might be a child that is sick or has some kind of uh, uh, problem, and if you put glasses, it becomes worse. But then if, if, there, if you have to enforce the evaluation result, the glasses have to be you have to put the glasses on, there's no question. So uh, there's, there's a debate around how enforceable evaluation should be. But also, uh, there's a, a question of whether ev the evaluator should also be in charge of communicating the evidence. And, and here I think there are very many, many examples. But normally, when we ask somebody to evaluate a program, what we do is we ask in the terms of reference, evaluate, and then in the end, give us the recommendations. And many times, 
uh, thinking about recommendations is a totally different thing that has to do with political aspects, with many, many other things. And uh, some, uh, many times evaluators are professionals that are very experienced and good at measuring. But they're not necessarily good at knowing what exactly you should do with that measure. And there's uh, a gap there that, uh, that needs to be filled. And I think 3IE has done a very good job there. And there are three practical examples that I will go through very, very quickly. Well, in the South African, you might want me to spend more time. I don't know. <laughs> no, OK. But uh, there's one example from uh, Peru where they established an, an uh, evaluation office. But instead of only having the logical framework in this way, they added the box in the top saying that their final objective is to increase the impact, efficiency, quality, equity, and transparency and of development and social inclusion policies and programs. So this is not contributing to something that might happen or not because it's somebody else's question. It's actually assuring that you increase the impact. So this, uh, when, you, when you establish your objective in that way, it leads you to a whole series of different, uh, different questions. For example, how can I make sure that this information will be used and then measure the use of the information, what impact that had on reality, and so on. But it changes, um, it changes um, the, the picture very significantly. And then there are other two cases, South Africa and Mexico, which I think have made many in interesting efforts. A lot of what is uh, in South Africa has been developed by Ian, and it's uh, in the website. But it's creating a bridge between the specialized function of evaluating and the function of taking decisions for improving and executing policies. So on the one hand, you have technical capacities of some, of, of some kind, and in the other, you have other, other uh, attributes. And creating the bridge uh, is what uh, the efforts have been around in South Africa. For example, I would encourage you to go to the website, or even in the session of, of questions can answer we can go more deeply into this, but they have a series of instruments to guide the, the policymaker or somebody taking decisions in government programs, a guide, a very detailed guide of how to use evidence, how to produce an improvement plan, a whole set of tools that simplifies their life. And in Mexico, it's a, a, a very a similar story with different, uh, with different uh, uh, instruments. One particularly interesting one is that they changed the way in which poverty is measured officially to link it more closely with the outcomes in, var in variables that are not only income but many others. And those you can link to programs. And it makes you e easier for whoever is in the implementation side to see what exactly the effect of an improvement would be not only on the program but in, in poverty. So the, I think uh, I congratulate Howard again for his work. And I think one of the things he started and that uh, perhaps is a big road for, for uh, doing much more in the future, is in thinking of the evaluation function as a tool for, pol uh, for policy improvement and judging it as uh, in terms of how much it actually improves uh, policy. Thank you.